place in the United States, they have this Samaritan, right, the Good Samaritan Law. This means that if you, you see a person being beat up or being robbed, if you don't aid or help them, then you can be put in prison yourself. Why? Because this uh, parable is really, you know, describe what human being supposed to be like, especially for us as Christians. Let's turn to the book of Luke, chapter 10, verse 25 to verse 37. Luke chapter 10, verse 25 to verse 37. Verse 25. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, Road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at the place, came and looked and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion. So he went to him and bandaged, him, bandaged his wound, poured on oil and wine, and set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. On the next day, when he departed, he took out two denarii, gave to them to the innkeeper, and said to him, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. So which of these three do you think was neighbor to him who fell among thieves? Verse 37. And he said, He who showed mercy on him, then Jesus said to him, Go and do Likewise, I think many of us are very familiar with this parable, and this parable is about a good Samaritan. A good Samaritan is not, you know, they are, uh, even though they are good, to the Jews, they are just like sinners. So our Lord Jesus Christ, if we look at the summary or the setting of this uh, parable, the first character that was introduced was this a certain lawyer. And this lawyer, he stood up and he tested our Lord, our Lord Jesus Christ. And we can see a lawyer, or sometimes they call him a scribe. A lawyer referred to one who is well versed in the law of Moses. So just put this in our minds, thinking that our Lord Jesus Christ is a son of carpenter, and he was not learned, he was not a scholar, so, of course, compare this to the scribe or to the lawyer, you know, his wisdom, his knowledge is not as you know, good as the lawyer, if we compare that to our Lord Jesus Christ. But in this passage, it seems, if you look at it, it seems that the lawyer's intention is to draw attention to himself and to a certain Jesus' knowledge of the law. But then we can see that he stood up, why did he stood up? Because he wanted to draw attention to himself. Then he tested Jesus. Of course, some people, when you read from the original text, this tested Jesus, it doesn't mean that it was in negative you know, intention. But whatever it is, he wants to know what kind of knowledge and what kind of wisdom does our Lord Jesus Christ have? Because all this time he go around teaching people the law of Moses and he's teaching the, the word of God. So that's why this lawyer, he wanted to see what our Lord Jesus Christ know. Then, in verse 29, and this lawyer, he sought to justify himself. Because during the time, our Lord Jesus Christ asked him the question, right? And, of course, the lawyer, he answered it correctly. Then at the end, he tried to justify himself. Who is my neighbor? 
Who is my neighbor? And that's why our Lord Jesus Christ put forth this parable. And Jesus responded to this, uh, to this lawyer, a parable by the Good Samaritan, and instructed the lawyer to do likewise. So when we look at this setting and we look at what's going on, if we put ourselves you know, uh, during that time, and what is, you know, what's going through the mind of our Lord Jesus Christ, and what's going on through the mind of the lawyer, and also what's going on in the minds of all the people around them. And we continue. Say, a man traveled from Jerusalem to Jericho. That is the first thing that Jesus Christ spoke of. And quite often we can see that from Jerusalem to Jericho is a distance of about 20 miles. And some people say this represents, right, the, I guess, the downfall of one's faith. Because Jerusalem is a city of peace, and they go all the way to down, right? Go down all the way to Jericho. But it doesn't matter how you and I look at it. If, you know, maybe our faith is weak, we left Jerusalem, go to Jericho. Actually, that's not the main point. The main point that Jesus Christ want to put forth here is that the compassion that the Good Samaritan had. And we can see the distance is about 20 miles. And this 20 miles, this road, actually, is very dangerous. I look at some history on the road from Jerusalem to, uh, to Jericho. There's a nickname for that road. They call it the Bloody Pass. Why right? the Bloody Pass? Or the Road of Blood. Why? Because during a time, whoever walk on that road, there's a lot of thieves, there's a lot of robbers, and a lot of people being killed, being hurt on that road. And that's why they name it in such a way. But people still... No, took those, that road to go to Jericho because that is the shortest distance between Jerusalem and Jericho. And then on his journey, he is robbed and wound, wounded by thieves. Right? This is the reason why Jesus Christ brought this forth because it's very common on that road that people be robbed by thieves and they're left on the road half dead. And Jesus Christ also realized that during that time, Many people, really. Because it happens so frequently. People just see people getting robbed, have dead people just walk by. You know, when I first read this parable, I just feel like there's no way that people just walk by if you see a person is half dead and a person on a road being robbed by thieves. But when I went to Africa, uh, there's also things like this happen all the time. And one of the African brothers shared me, when a person being robbed, you should not help them. And ask them why. Because when, there's, when they get robbed, it's not only one robbers. There's, there's a whole gang of robbers. So if you try to go and help a person being robbed, you yourself be hurt. So one time I went to the city, and right before I get there, there's a person was getting robbed, was getting beat, and he just laying on the street, and everybody just walked by. And I, for me, I asked my senior minister, I said, should we go and help him? He's, he's like, no. And I really, I just, okay, it's fine. I just also walked by. But during the time, it just the thought came to my mind. It's like, no, no, who are we and what are we? How can we be able to stand, see a person die on the road, die on the street, and just walking by? But during that time, actually, in Africa, it's so common. Life worth very little. But that's why you and I as Christians, we need to change the way of life like that. So that's why Luke Jesus Christ, you know, shared this parable. Yes, he was on his journey. He was robbed and wounded by thieves. And maybe people say, you know, the reason why he was robbed by thieves is because he came, you know, from Jerusalem all the way down to Jericho. But that's not the important part. And that's not the important part. The important part is this. A priest and Levi pass by. Right? In verse 31 and verse 32, it describes the priest and Levi that pass by, and they saw the man. They saw the man. And what they do? They just cross to the other street, uh, on the cross to the street, and then they just walk. Even though the Bible said, 
the priests and the Levites, they saw by this man. They saw this man. So on purpose, they crossed to the other side of the street and they just walked by. And who are these priests and Levites? They're both our religious leaders in Israel. So in other words, that these are the people that know the word of God the best. They're the ones who should have the closest relationship to God. But why they did not stop and help this man? Because even though they know the word of God, even though they're the religious leaders during, the time of, during that time, but they have no compassion inside their heart. You know, for us, we also are spiritual priests. We also are spiritual Levite. And we also proclaim that we are the true church of God. But we can proclaim whatever we want. But our lives, our action, does it go according to the word of God? You know, nowadays, right, people just feel that you know, we should not say that we are the true church of God. We should not say we are the only church. Why is that? Not because our brother and sister do not believe in the word of God, but our brother and sister see how we behave in this society. And because of this, we just feel like, you know, if we are truly true, and we are the true worship of our Lord Jesus Christ, why all these things we have not done? Charity works, right? That's one thing, right? right? It's, I mean, our charity works in the United States actually is, is quite poor right? compared to other Christian denominations. But of course, for us, we should, you know, let's not even go there. Just go to the everyday thing. Right? Everyday thing that, you know, that, that, that you and I encounter. Do we have this kind of compassion? Do we have this kind of love? especially to the person who is wounded, who is being left dead on the road. Actually, this is more about compassion on the soul of man. On the soul of man. When you and I look at all the people in the world, and we look at the people around us that we encounter every day, do we look at them with compassion? We know that a lot of people in this world, they are wounded. Their life is half dead. Why? Because they have no hope. They have no peace. They have no joy. But do you and I have this compassion that we want to preach to them? We want to save their soul. Do we have that kind of feeling inside of us? You know, sometimes we have our own difficulties, right? We ourselves are wounded. And we ourselves are hurt. And because of this, it's very difficult to help others. It's very difficult to help others. And that's why you and I need to strengthen ourselves. So only when you and I are strong that we can help those who are wounded, help those who are weak. And we continue to see that the third person who passed by was a Samaritan. Actually, a Samaritan, they descended from a different nation. They were imported during the Assyrian uh, captivity during that time. And also, the Jews have no dealing with the Samaritan. You know, when our Lord Jesus Christ asked the lawyer, which one, right, love his neighbor more? And then the lawyer say, the one, right, the one that show the most mercy. Why well, didn't say the Samaritan? The, the, you know, the Samaritan that he showed the, the, the most mercy, he didn't say the Samaritan because for the Jew, they just feel like Samaritan, they are low-class people, right? And they're not true worshiper of God. And that's why Jesus Christ actually brought this example for the lawyer to realize, to open his eyes, to say that, yes, you know the word of God really well, but you don't put it to practice just like the priest, just like the Levite. So for us, we also in this kind of dilemma. 
For sure, God has revealed us the truth. And we know the truth. But that's not enough. We need to put that truth into practice. Including myself, actually. Sometimes when I pray to our Lord Jesus Christ, I just feel that I don't do enough. And the older I get seems, the more that the love that I have inside my heart is less than before. And this is my weakness. And I try to pray to God to give me more strength. Because after dealing with people for so many years, sometimes I feel that, you know, I have less patience. I have less love. I mean, when I first came to Christ, everybody I encountered, I preached the gospel to them. It doesn't matter how, you know, much I know about the Bible, I just feel so excited. Right? Every one of my co-workers, I preach the gospel to them. It doesn't matter who they are. All the friends I know, I preach the gospel to them. But of course, maybe after trying all these years, and now when you see a person, you feel reluctant, right? For my side, I just feel like, I know they're wounded. I know they're hurt. But maybe they don't want to be healed. Right? That is what's going through my mind, right? And sometimes when you preach to them, sometimes you get offended, whatever it is. But none of those things should stop us from showing love and compassion to those who need to be safe, to those who need to be safe. So that's why the Jews have no dealing with the Samaritan. So when our Lord Jesus Christ put forth this parable, of course they are thinking that how can the Samaritan is a good Samaritan that shows such great love and compassion and he doesn't even really know the word of God. You know, in my lifetime, the, the most loving person, the most generous person, actually, is not our church members that I have met. Of course, there's a lot of church members that are very generous, very loving. But there's also people in the world, even though they do not know our Lord Jesus Christ, even though they do not believe in our Lord Jesus Christ, but by nature, they are very loving, they are very kind. But for you and I, we should even, we should even you know, go beyond that. That everyone who encounter with us, they feel a kind of love, they feel a kind of compassion. So the name of Lucius Christ can be glorified. And look at the Samaritan. Right? Why did the Samaritan have compassion on this wounded man? Because the priest, the Levite, the action was exactly the same, including the Samaritan. They walked and they saw. But actually, the priest and Levite, they did not really see. And you know, we cannot really blame also on the priest and the Levite. Why? Because they have no obligation to, to help this man. And also, they might endanger their own lives if they stop and help. Right? Because maybe they do not know if the robber is still there, the thief is still there. Maybe the man who's wounded, maybe he's faking. Because it's a very common thing too. Right? People would fake, like you know, people's robbing them, this and that. So when you try to help them, then of course, all the other robbers will come and, and, and rob you. So what we're saying that we can come up with many different excuses. What's the reason why we do not do this, we do not do that? But if you and I truly have compassion for the soul of mankind, if we truly have compassion for the soul of man. We want to save them. We want them to be healed by Jesus Christ. Then there's nothing stopping us. I remember when I was in Boston, during a time we were very active in evangelism. So all the youth, you know, inviting everybody, right? Invite everybody to come to, and their time was happening at, at my apartment. And at first I was thinking that, hey, all these strangers come to my apartment. <laughs> Why, you know, I don't know what kind of people they are, right? Maybe they just want to come. Maybe they know where we live. Maybe they want to rob us. All of this reason came to my mind, right? Because we live in the city and there's a lot of crazy people over there. But then it's just a thought came over me. He says, why do I worry about all of those things? Don't I worship the true and living God? If my intention is to invite them, and our brother and sister intention is to invite them to come to know the word of God, why do I worry that something can happen to, to my house? What is there for them to take? That's worth more 
than the soul of the truth seekers. And that was my thought. And from then on, you know, yes, invite everybody. Whatever chance you have, just invite. At one point, there's about six to eight youth doing one of the evangelical service was 25, actually 27 true seekers came during a time. Because we have the heart, we have that compassion for the soul of man. And God bless us so much during that time. So that's why for us, yes, the priests and Levites, right, they can bring all the excuses they want. But at the end, they do not practice the word of God. Just like for you and I, we also can come up with many different excuses. Why we don't do this, why we don't do that, include myself. But at the end, God knows our heart, what kind of compassion that we have on the soul of mankind. And look at this Samaritan. Yeah, the Samaritan, what's the difference between the Samaritan, the Levites, and, and the priests? He has compassion. How come this Samaritan, who do not know God, they're not a true worshiper of God, knows how to love others? That is the Lord Jesus Christ's point. He bandaged the man's wound and poured oil and wine on it. So when he saw this man, of course the man we don't know, he's a Jew or he's a, he's a, he's a Samaritan, the one that's you know, half dead on the road. But all the Samaritans saw that he was wounded, he was hurt, he needed help. That's what he did. That's what moved his heart. So he went there and bandaged the man's wounds and pour oil and wine on it. For us, the greater compassion we have on our brothers and sisters and on one another and on men and human in general is also to put oil and wine on them when they are wounded. That is the Holy Spirit. And God has given us this oil and wine. So when you see you know, people in the world, they are wounded, they are hurt, they are sad, they are lonely. The best thing for you and I to do is to kneel down and pray for them. But it's not easy, right? It seems just like a simple thing. It seems just a simple thing. You know, for me, when I first came to become a pastor, and of course, pastor, what do we do most of the time? We just pray for our brothers and sisters and pray for truth seekers. And I thought, how hard can this be? You know, how hard can it be just kneel down and pray? But actually, it's very difficult. Why? Because the minute you and I kneel down and pray for a person, Satan knows this is the most effective way to bandage anybody's wound is through a prayer. And because of this, Satan does not want us to be on our knees praying for others. And you realize, too, when you kneel down and pray, and after you're praying, you feel so exhausted. You feel so exhausted, and you feel like, how come? All you're doing is going on your knees and just praying and tongue. That's it. It should be a simple thing, but why do we feel exhausted? Because spiritually speaking, we are fighting against Satan. Spirit, uh, spiritually speaking, it's a great battle between us and Satan, when we pray for one another. But this is the best thing that Lord Jesus Christ has given to us. We don't need to be a physician. We don't need to be a great doctor to be able to heal people's wounds. Because when you and I pray, the great physician is our Lord Jesus Christ. He is the one that is willing and able to heal their wound through our prayer. And another thing, and he puts the wounded man on his animal and brought him to an inn. It's not an easy task. When a person is wounded, they have no strength. So you need to have a lot of strength to pick him up and to put him on the animal. So in other words, when you and I kneel down and pray for others, and we try to help others, it takes a lot of our own strength, for sure. And here, see this man, he put, the Samaritan put this man on his own animal. 
So what does this mean? This means that the man no longer can ride this animal, right? The Samaritan no longer can ride this animal. So the Samaritan have to walk. Why? Because he gave this animal to the wounded man. This is a great sacrifice. We don't know, maybe it's only been three miles from Jerusalem to Jericho. Maybe it's been five or ten miles. Whatever it is, even he's halfway to Jericho, he had to walk at least ten more miles. And trying to take care of this wounded man, even though he put, on, put him on his animal, it doesn't mean it's easy, right? Because that kind of road, you make sure the man doesn't fall off. Make sure the road is not so rough that this man, the wound, can be open even more. Have to be careful, look at this man, make sure he's not bleeding too much. All of these things can bring a lot of stress, can bring a lot of burden, bring a lot of hardship to this Samaritan man. But did he think of any of these things? No. Why? Because he was compelled by love. And for me, I'm a firm believer in that. When you and I have love inside our heart. Everything we do, we do it with, with, you know, with no effort at all. Because that love is the strength. That love will give us the strength and compel us to continue to do whatever we need to do. Just like this man. No, I'm just thinking like, you know, this man, yeah, he's walking. He must be tired. This Samaritan, he's walking. He must be tired. But now he has to help this person then go all the way, right, to be able to reach to Jericho and go to an inn to help him. And when he did that, he also gives the innkeeper two denarii, two day wage, to provide additional care for the wounded man. So here, when the Samaritan brought this wounded man to the inn, he also took some time to take care of him, make sure everything is okay. But before he left, he also wanted to make sure that the wounded man is okay. And that's why he gave the innkeeper two denarii for two days' wage to provide additional care for the wounded man. Actually, this innkeeper represents our Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, our Lord Jesus Christ, he can do everything, but we also have to do our part. Our part is to pray for people. Even though we give them to our Lord Jesus Christ to take care of, but we also must continue to do our part because we love that person. We have compassion on that person. Then we can see that he instructed the innkeeper to take care of the wounded man to whatever extent needed and that the innkeeper would be repaid when the Samaritan returned. How wonderful this is. You know, when you and I read this, there's one more thing that when this man left, right? When, actually, when this man left, and then maybe the wounded man, I mean the Samaritan left, when the wounded man awakened, he has no idea which person that brought him to the end. He doesn't know his name. He doesn't know what he looks like. So what does this mean that the Samaritan, he did not do it because he wants someone to say thank you to him. He did not do it because he wanted to you know, receive some kind of glory for himself. None of these things. He did what he needed to do and he just left. And I'm sure no one gave him thanks. Even the wounded man because he doesn't know who he was. So when you and I helping others, when we're praying for others, I remember one time an elder, he'd been praying for this young person for five years. For five years. But no one knew that every day he'd been praying for this young man. Until one day, this young man shared with him that he received the Holy Spirit. And then the, the, the elder asked him, how long ago did you receive the Holy Spirit? Say about six months ago. And he said, oh, you should have told me, right? <laughs> because all this time I've been praying for you. Until now. No one knows. Maybe the reason why God blessed this young man with the Holy Spirit because the prayer of this elder. But he didn't take credit. He didn't say anything. He just 
do because he loved this young man. And the same thing with this Samaritan. And for us, how can we overcome social and racial and cultural barriers? I see this is also what our Lord Christ tried to teach the lawyer also, right? Why did he use the good Samaritan as a Samaritan and not you know, any other person? Because during that time, the Samaritan, the one that the Jews, or the Israelites, oppressed the most. They just looked down on them, this and that, right? But that did not stop the Samaritan from showing love, from showing mercy. Because this parable is the contrast between the Samaritan and the priest and the Levite. And despite how the Samaritan was viewed by the Jews, the compassion that the Samaritan had overcame the social barrier. And that's why for us, we must continue to pray and really ask God to fill us with His love. And that's what I try to do every day too. I just feel that I, I don't have enough love. I don't have enough love. Because of this, everything I do becomes very burdensome. Become very burdensome. Then I pray that one day that everything that I do for our Lord Jesus Christ becomes so effortless. That my heart is so joyful to do it. And when I, you know, uh, serving our, uh, our brothers and sisters, I feel the same way. Effortless. And this is my goal. And this is my goal. And, of course, our time is so busy nowadays. Well, our time is so, not so busy nowadays. But this Samaritan offered his time, even though he was busy. He's on his way. He's on his journey. Right? Why did he have oil? And why did he have wine? It must be for a purpose. He's also busy. But that did not stop him. Just like for you and I. But we often a very busy schedule. And we know we always have things to do, and this and that. You know, and some people, you know, their time is so valuable. If you want to ask them to come, for example, to talk for an hour, maybe they charge a million dollars right, for that one hour, just to talk. Some people's time is very valuable. And all of us, we know that we are very busy. But we also need to be busy in doing on God's work. So this Samaritan, he took the time to stop and care for this wounded man. We have no idea how long you know, it delayed his journey. And not only that, because when he took him to an end, he also stayed there and also delayed his journey. But this is what love is. This is what compassion is. And we have to give unconditionally. We have to give unconditionally. Just in addition to energy, time, and provision, the Samaritan offered an open-ended agreement with the innkeeper to provide care for the wounded man and did not expect anything in return. No, one time a, uh, a sister shared me that like, you know, I, I would love to continue to be a truth seeker. And I, I say, why? See, when I was a truth seeker, every time I come to church, all the brothers and sisters say, hi, hello, how are you doing? It takes so much time. And during lunch, people sit around, around her and talk to her and share stories with her. But now that she's a member, no one say hi anymore. And sometimes she eats, she just eats by herself. And nobody's around anymore. When I heard that, I, you know, I, I feel very sad because this, what she's saying is true. In a sense that, you no, know, when we see... A person is wounded, being bandaged and being good, then we stop showing compassion, we stop showing love. But it shouldn't be this way. It shouldn't be this way. No, I, there's a comedian who joke around that, no, really, people don't really care for one another anymore. Just like when people say, hi, how are you, before a person answered, they just you know, walk by and just leave. But now it's one step further than that. People say, you good? You good? That's it, they just... They just left, right? Because they just, you know, they just already, you know, uh, input that you are good, so you don't need to talk to me, right? So yeah, you're good, you're good. And then you, you just leave, right? So sometimes when we as brothers and sisters, we also feel like that. When we come to church, where is the love? 
Where's the compassion? Where's that fellowship? All of us, we need to improve. Really, almost every church I go to, there's always someone eating by themselves. It's very interesting. Or no one is really talking to them. It shouldn't be like this. But all of us, include myself, need to take the time to show more love, to show more compassion. Because you and I are priests. You and I are the Levites. Because of this, God expects more from us. Because we know his word, and we know what it means to have compassion on one another. Now let's all rise and sing hymn 343. I'm sorry, 343.